By the way, we will have uh, the Lord's Supper at the end of the service today, so I think there's no better thing to do when you're studying about the future is to enjoy uh, a preview of what's to come and we, we celebrate the great reminder that our sins have been taken care of by the Lord Jesus Christ. And I, that's my heart for this church, that uh, we move into the real territory that God has for us as a church um, even theologically speaking, that's a, it's not just a building. It's not just about a building project. It's about maximizing every moment we have. I think about Toby, and I think about the shortness of his life. I mean, just a very short life on earth, and yet life can change quickly. So what are we doing with the life we got, right? Are we using it as a, unto the Lord? Or are you just waiting to binge on your next, you know... Um, you know, series on Netflix, you know, get, get into the Word of God and study it like never before. Because it's all good preparation for your future. You know, make sure you're watching good television and things that are um, edifying to your soul. In, this new, in the New Testament commentary uh, put out by Dr. Warren Wearsby, I believe there's a slide up of that on the screen, called Be Victorious. Um, the overall theme of it is, in Christ you are an overcomer. This is all based, it's an expository commentary on the book of Revelation. And uh, Dr. Wearsby puts it this way, jo John's prophecy, this is about the book of Revelation, John's prophecy is primarily the revelation of Jesus Christ. Notice what he says here, not the revelation of future events. You must not divorce the person from the prophecy. For without the person, there could be no fulfillment of the prophecy. He is not incidental to its action, wrote Dr. Merrill Tenney. He is its chief subject. In Revelation 1 to 3, Christ is seen as the exalted priest, king, ministering to the churches. In Revelation 4 and 5, he is seen in heaven as the glorified Lamb of God, reigning on the throne. In Revelation 6 through 18, Christ is the judge of all the earth. And in Revelation 19, he returns to earth as the conquering king of kings. The book closes with the heavenly bridegroom, notice what he says here, ushering his bride, the church, so exciting, into the glorious heavenly city. Whatever you do, as you study this book, get to know your Savior better. Amen? Such a great nugget by Dr. Wearsby. In John chapter 14, so much, let me just put it this way. In John chapter 14, there's a prophetic statement made by John the Apostle concerning the words of the Lord Jesus. And Jesus said in John 14, verses 1 to 3, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If, for, if it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself that where I am, there you may be also. Jesus wants one thing clear. He is the heavenly bridegroom, and the believer who trusts in him becomes part of his church, and he's coming back to rescue the church before the great tribulation. Amen? Amen. So you say, Pastor, there seems to be a really long delay here, 2,000 years to the present. Like, why is all this continuing to happen? Because God loves sinners, and He always will, but He will not always strive with them. All the things that you and I see coming through are, you know, just the news and the lawlessness and all this other incredible, just open rebellion against authority in our culture. It is just off the charts. And not only that, I mean, there, there, if, if you are a student of Bible prophecy in any capacity and you pay attention to the developments presently going on in the world, whether it be the financial industry, whether it be the technology industry, whether it be what's happening in the nations, for instance, Sudan and what's been happening there, um, you name it, there is an increased amount of activity. 
Israel presently has 250,000 missiles pointing at them by their loving neighbors. <laughs> They're not loving. They hate Israel. Satan hates Israel. Satan hates the church because everything stands on one thing. Jesus Christ is who he says he is and he's the Lord who died, was crucified, risen again, shed his blood for us and he's coming again. Anybody who calls upon him will be saved. Amen. That's the reality that we offer. It's not just blend Jesus in with a few other of your best, you know, thought through systems, although I'm not discouraging you from looking at other systems, but recognize one thing, with Jesus, he is the way, the truth, and the life, and he would go on to say that in this set of uh, verses in John chapter 14, he is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but through him. He's the gatekeeper, okay? He's the door. There's no knocking on that door and saying, Jesus, I beg you, please let me in after you're dead. You, you, you call upon Him now. Sins must be forgiven on the earth. And that's according to Scripture. Sins don't get forgiven in heaven. Right? They don't. It's like, okay, I'm finally here. Jesus, can you forgive me? Well, you didn't, do with, you didn't do with me what you could have done with me on the earth. I could have washed you white as snow because what we're about to look at in just a moment is going to be a picture of who's surrounding Jesus Christ in heaven. Today we're going to observe the holy atmosphere, the holy environment, the sounds, the description of what's to come in literal fulfillment that the apostle was tasked by Jesus Christ to tell us. Revelation chapter 4, if you were here last Sunday, we actually put this up in a visual read, kind of like breaking it, breaking it down, like, okay, imagine what this imagery is like. Um, and I believe it's videobible.com. If you want to go there, you can see some of the passages of Scripture. This is a, a whole GoFundMe effort where um, it's a, we're crowdfunded where you can actually you know, be supporting them as these artists and these theologians take a look and try to put accurate descriptions of some of what I think is sometimes, frankly, hard to get your mind around. Some of this imagery is hard to get your mind around. It's like, this is hard stuff. And, and you, let me just tell you this thing. Okay, Satan does not want you knowing the end game. He wants you, he wants you occupied with this planet. Just stuck thinking, I will die and go to heaven. I'm telling you, believer, your future is way more than you just dying and going to heaven, okay? That is an awesome reality, but do you realize you can get a glimpse now into your glorious future and what God is holding back from the church? He's not allowing the church to go through this tribulation. Let me point this out too. In the first three chapters of the book of Revelation, the church is mentioned 19 times. From chapter 4 to chapter 19, the church is not mentioned. Meanwhile, what's happening in chapters 4 and 5 is this picture of heaven, and then from 6 to 19 are these judgments that are being poured out on the earth. That God in his sovereignty knew long ago that this is what the earth would need to be a last call to the Jewish nation and to the Gentile nations, all to bring them one more opportunity to bow their knee to Jesus Christ. But in that time, known as the Great Tribulation, will be the most turbulent time upon the earth. That is, Jesus says, unless those days were cut short, no flesh would survive. We have organizations today who are dedicated to depopulating the earth. You realize in the book of Revelation, there are things that are going to look at it that are going to be pretty horrifying to think. What is the cost of going into this tribulation? People are like, well, Pastor, this isn't, this isn't popular stuff. This doesn't make me feel good. It doesn't really matter to me, okay? <laughs> I'm not trying to offend you, but I want, it, I want you to know that I want you to know the truth that God has set forth in his word so that you are better prepared to live in these days as you see that day approaching. The blessed hope for the Christian is that you are saved and Jesus could come for you at any moment. Amen? And if you happen to live your full life and it's like, you know, another 200 years goes by, which is possible, I really don't, and those of us who kind of look at this stuff realize this, we are on an accelerated trend of things that are happening in the earth. And these things are very, you know, very hard to ignore. Like, well, where's this all going? I watched a video last night in Australia of a woman who was proud that she now has a mark on her skin under her skin and she goes to and fro in Australia and she's like, look at me, I just scanned my hand and they know my medical data and they know this and they know it. And it's like, you're freaking me out, okay? But 
Again, she did not take the official mark of the beast. The scripture says that a mark will be needed in that time frame as the world becomes globalized, and that's the agenda of this present world system. The Bible says that this whole world lies in the lap of the evil one. Hello? Are you like not paying attention? It is true. Jesus knows he left us here, but not without hope and comfort and assurance. He says, don't fear those who can kill the body. Rather fear him who can put both body and soul in hell. But when you have Jesus, there's no chance of you going to hell. Thank you, Lord. That's when we celebrate this supper. We're celebrating a full payment made on my behalf. It's a complete and total payment. Sins have been forgiven. They have been removed. Psalm 103 says, as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Yeah, you still get, they still entangle us in this life, but in terms of how God sees you, Christian, he sees you sinless because of what Jesus did for you. It should cause us to fall on our knees in complete dependence and say, Lord, sanctify me in holiness. Help me to be sanctified and live a life that pleases you. If you've given me this perfect status, this perfect righteousness, how dare me? not live in a way that would honor you and please you. If you've done this by your grace, now I don't think, listen, God gives his grace whether I fully appreciate it or not. So just saying, this is not contingent on my appreciation. What I should do is be growing in that appreciation. I should be growing in love with my Savior. I'm the bride and he's the bridegroom. And he's left me here. And if you know anything about the way that Israel's, the, the, the Jewish customs and how the bridegroom gets a place ready, and then he comes one evening and he snatches his bride. And that's exactly because he's been preparing that place. And John chapter 14 is a picture of Jesus Christ preparing a place for us. Paul says that, um, you know, if... Um, to be absent from the bodies, to be present with the Lord. So you say, well, pastor, what happens to people like my loved ones who knew Jesus and they died and we had their funeral? Toby, for instance, the moment Toby breathed his last breath in Boston after that med flight and they tried to work on him, Toby breathes his last breath, to be absent from the bodies, to be present with the Lord. That's our assurance. I mean, so that's that's like, we, we can't lose, right? But we certainly know a time is coming where the Lord Jesus will call those on the earth home to be with him in an instant bible calls it the twinkling of an eye let's read this text in revelation chapter 4 and we're going to try to cover these points before 3 p.m right trevor amen i know he's going to get home all right here we go and i again if you were here last week you heard me um you heard this read on a video bible after these things i looked and behold a door standing open in heaven this is the apostle john telling us what he observed, where he was, and what happened. And the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me, saying, come up here, and I will show you things which must take place after this. Immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne set in heaven, and one sat on the throne, and he who sat there was like a jasper and a sardius stone in appearance, and there was a rainbow around the throne in appearance, like an emerald. Around the throne were 24 thrones, and on the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting, clothed in white. Robes, uh, white robes, and they had crowns of gold on their heads, and from the throne proceeded lightnings, thunderings, and voices. Seven lamps of fire were burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Before the throne Before the throne there was a sea of glass like crystal, and in the midst of the throne and around the throne were four living creatures full of eyes in front and in back. The first living creature was like a lion, the second living creature like a calf, the third living creature had a face like a man, and the fourth living creature was like a flying eagle. The four living creatures, each having six wings, were full of eyes around and within, and they do not rest day and night, saying, Holy, Holy holy lord god almighty who was and is and is to come 
Whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. That is Revelation chapter 4. So just a what i want to do is sort of pick up where we didn't get to last week and hopefully we'll just cover these briefly this morning before we take the lord's supper number one if you're going to behold the future you need to understand things like you need to hear what's happening here like let's hear let's understand what this atmosphere contains what are some of the things in heaven that are that are present that will be revealed that are going to that john saw this that these are the type of things that are part of literal prophetic fulfillment that are coming in our future we want, let's understand the holiness of heaven. That's number two. And number three, there will, nev- there will be never ending worship. You know, the scripture talks about in the book of Hebrews that it'll give a sacrifice of praise, the praise of our lips. How many, how, let's be honest. How many days do you just feel like worshiping God? You wake up Monday morning. And I'm not saying you don't get up and you have your quiet time, you have your coffee, whatever you do, and you, you worship God. But does that, does that stay with you? How about by 10 a.m. when you're deprived of coffee, okay? <laughs> or you got something else going on, or somebody called you with bad news, or some other, other thing, and, and just a stress, and a child, and a, and a this, or you know, your, your son, or in our case, has bigger needs, and sometimes we are able to sometimes feel like we can meet in the moment. Um, so there's, there are things that happen. And so sometimes it's like, do you, you know, what do we do with those things? What do we do with the things of our life that we just wind up just letting them happen? Again, I'm not saying that if you're not praising God 24 seven, that you're a bad Christian, please don't hear that. But the atmosphere that we're talking about that's coming is an atmosphere of complete and total perfection and purity. And that atmosphere is going to be where we will be for all eternity. And so let's talk a little bit about these. So around the throne were 24 thrones, and on the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting clothed in white robes, and they had crowns of gold on their heads. And from the throne proceed lightnings, thunderings, and voices. Seven lamps of fire were burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Around the principal throne were 24 lesser thrones. So there's one major throne where the Lord Jesus Christ is there, and on these, you know, the, and the 24 lesser thrones, which were seated, 24 elders, they were dressed in white and were wearing crowns of gold in their heads. The crowns were similar to those given in victors in Greek games. That's why I think Warren Wearsby, in the title of his Revelation commentary, is called Be Victorious. This is the future of every believer. See, a lot of people teach today, unless you're like super duper Christian, then you're not saved. I want to tell you, the thief on the cross was not a super duper Christian by any stretch. At one point of his suffering on the cross, he was actually cursing Jesus. But by the end, he says to Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And what did Jesus say to him? In paradise. Excellent audience. you, Just terrific. Um, So, The victor isn't necessarily somebody who's done a lot of great things. That's reward ceremony. Oh, that's going to be glorious. And it's like, just just make sure you recognize that salvation is always a gift. You cannot earn it. You can't be good enough for it. You can try so hard, and I get it. Listen, there's nothing wrong with trying to be a really, you know, effective Christian. But if you're basing your effectiveness on actually, like, proving that I'm saved then you're, in the, you're, you're actually mixing up grace and works, which gets dealt with completely numerous times in the Scripture. Works are great in the sense if they're really done by the Holy Spirit through us, the Holy Spirit actually generates in you the things that are actually the things that please God. Our flesh doesn't please God. It's actually at war with him, but Jesus, when he dies on the cross, he takes that old nature and it's nailed to the cross with him. So he doesn't have to look at it anymore. And when he sees you, he sees himself. You're a reflection of him. But now you want to learn to live through the strength of the Spirit a victorious life. And uh, the, the, the imagery here is what's happening in heaven. 
They were dressed in white and were wearing crowns of gold on their heads. The crowns were similar to those given victors in the Greek game, Stephanos. In contrast with the crowns of the sovereign ruler, Diadem. Some of us know that from one of the hymns that we sing. Um, the crown, the, remember, is a, is a crown hymn with many crowns, right? You, some of you know that song. Some of you, you old hymn students, you know the hymns. You like the old hymns, right? And they are. And I'm, I'm going to ask Trevor next week if we can sing Holy, Holy, Holy. Right, can we do that, brother? All right, awesome. Thank you. All right. We want to actually appreciate the holiness of God, that we get to live in it now. We actually get to experience God's character and His mercy and His grace. But someday it's all going to be fully realized. And John is giving us a picture of what's coming. The crown seemed to indicate that the elders had been judged and rewarded. They're in white robes. That's how Jesus Christ sees the believer in a robe of righteousness. They represent the church raptured prior to this time and then rewarded in heaven. What happens after the rapture of the church? That's the catching up of the believer, the harpazo. When the believers are called, we go and we have an appointment, a personal appointment with Jesus. Now, if you've gone in the rapture, that judgment isn't defining where you're going for eternity because you're already with Christ. You wouldn't be at the judgment seat of Christ. However, you may not have much to show. <laughs> that is quite possible. But thank God he looks at the heart. So you say, well, pastor, like, well, what does that mean? I'm not as busy as you. Well, that's okay. You're not called to be as busy as me. But what are you called to do in your world? How are you called to treat the people that God's given you? How are you able to show the grace of God in your life on the day-to-day -day basis? What has God given you to do? How does that work out? On Friday nights, we're, we're talking about the bait of Satan, which I think is a great companion study to what we're doing here. Because what happens in churches is that people get offended. It's common. They offended me, and I'm leaving. I'm sorry that you're leaving. We didn't want to offend you, and if you gave us an opportunity, we would have done everything we could to, be, you know, to make it right. To do what Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32 says, be kind to one another, tender, tenderhearted, just as God in Christ also forgave you. So we, we go with that. So, you know, if people are offended, you know, we're just all human. We're going to bump into each other. It's going to be prickly sometimes, okay? We're prickly people, right? I, called, I referred to, my, my, um, referred to our church to my wife last night, and I, this is no offense to anybody here. We are kind of the church of the misfits. And that's the truth. We all get stuff. We all get stuff going on. We all come from different backgrounds. You've got people who've been through all types of pain, brokenness, and yet we are the church that make the perfect fit. You're one of them, right, Bob? Yeah. Amen, brother. And I see, you all misfit too? All right, how many misfits here? Okay, let's all fit in. All right, we all fit in together. And a misfits make, they have the perfect fit. And God actually loves misfits. He, matter, he actually, somebody says, um, you know, does God like the weak? And it's like, oh yeah, he actually prefers them. So when you're weak, you know, what does Paul say? Then I'm strong. I will gladly boast about my weakness so that the power of Christ will rest upon me. Wow, yeah. So, but we want to also, you know, not just take a free pass, like, I'm just weak, I'm just weak. You know, you can be strong in Jesus. You know, our, our church, Grace Lighthouse Church, moving forward, this is like, wow. Like, God, God, you want to do this through us? This is how you want to provide through this church? You want, you want this to be a witness to the community? When we start interacting with a woman who's in the, probably some of the greatest grief of her life, and she says, I thank God that you guys are there to be an encouragement to the community at such a time as this. I'm like, wow. So we want to be those people who are ready, and, but we're also thinking ahead of our glorious future with Jesus that we will have an opportunity to be rewarded by him. Amen. So sweet. So I believe this group of people, they represent the church that's been raptured because given the context of uh, Revelation chapter 4 and 5, this is now all about John, who's a believer, who is now just in the full presence of God. The work of the church has a shelf life. Well, what do you mean, pastor? What do you mean, a shelf life? It means that the moment our Lord Jesus went back to heaven, and they look up and the, the angel said, hey, this same Jesus that has gone up before you, he will come in like manner, okay? Meanwhile, the Holy Spirit gets poured out on this early group of people in the book of Acts, right? They all hear their own languages being spoken. You, you see like this, this whole tongues, like the, because now the gospel's going out to the whole world. Last call, <laughs> come on in before he comes. 
He's coming again. The, 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 day, the day of the Lord has always been in the mind of the Jewish person. The Old Testament prophets always prophesied. So when Jesus shows up, it's like, he's here. Right, John the Baptist says, you know, behold the Lamb of God, takes away the sin of the world. And they're like, well, we want a Messiah. <laughs> you know, we want one who's coming on a white horse. We want, we want the descriptions that are, that, that are talked about way back in our scriptures. But they realize that, why did Jesus come the first time? Let me help you. To deal with sin. That's the number one issue he came for. He steadfastly set his eyes toward Jerusalem because he knew he was going to die there. And that moment was the moment that dealt with sin in full once and for all. There is no other need for any other sacrifice to make you righteous before God forever. Thank you, Lord, right? So special, so good. But this atmosphere is, is a, an atmosphere of holiness and revelation is so clear that nothing of any defiled nature will ever be in the presence of God. And you say, Pastor, well, I sometimes feel defiled. I actually still do things that make me feel defiled. In Jesus Christ, there is no defilement. If you're in Christ, God does not see you as this defiled mess. You can do messy things and let me not make an excuse for any of us to live a life of sinfulness. That is not what I'm saying. But let's get the facts straight. When Jesus saves you, He saves you to the uttermost. That's why you're calling upon the risen Lord Jesus. He's the only one who can do this. Amen. He's the only one. This is not about the goody two-shoes in Grace Lighthouse Church. We're all the goody two-shoes. No, we are sinners that have been saved by the matchless grace of God. And we're proud of it, okay? I'm proud of my Lord. Proud of what He's done for me. I want to speak boldly for Him because I know how good He is and what He's doing. He's coming again and I want to be ready for Him. I want to be so ready for Him. I want eyes looking out for Him. And I can deal with all types of junk that comes into our lives here at this church because the grace of God is mighty. And Paul says, the grace of God worked mightily through me. Paul's in some of the most defiled areas of the entire world, Roman world at that time. Temple, prostitutes, and you name it, all, every other thing. And here he is. And, he's, and, and God knows where we're at. He knows the environments that you're working. He knows around the people that you work, work with. And that's why it's so important to me when we're on our church property, whoever represents Grace Lighthouse Church, that you represent Jesus Christ. And you should speak as you represent him. That is so important that you represent the King of Kings who cleansed you and washed you and bled for you. And let's not be careless at how we represent him. I'm speaking right here to this guy right here, even the way that I drive sometimes, okay? Get that bumper sticker off your car if you're a terrible driver, okay? Because it's just no good testimony. So I'm like, you know, sometimes people beep at me. I'm like, oh, I'm, they don't know I'm a Christian. <laughs> you know, this big old Ford was behind me this morning on the way to church. Big white Ford. I'm like, who's that Ford? I'm like, I drive a Ford too. So I couldn't be t too hard on the guy. But it's like sometimes and just people just get right on your tail. They just want to like, you know, like they just, they're just mad that you're going the speed limit. Okay. Anyway, I digress. But anyway. Verse 5 here, the impressive scene of heaven was enhanced by flashes of lightning, rumblings, and, and peals of thunder. You know, if you've ever woken up by a thunderstorm, middle of the night, there's no mistaking that that was thunder. Just think of this atmosphere surrounding with these 24 elders, surrounding the one central throne that Jesus Christ is presently sitting on. Thunder is mentioned eight times in the book of Revelation. Chapter 4, chapter 6, chapter 8, chapter 11, chapter 14, chapter 16, chapter 19. John also saw seven lamps which were blazing. These seven lamps were said to be the seven spirits of God. These should be understood to, be re to represent the Holy Spirit rather than seven individual spirits or angels with the concept of the sevenfold character. Everything God does is complete and perfect. So when you see words like this, don't get mixed up. But it's important that we understand these things so that we're not mixed up. There's a lot in the book of Revelation, a lot of symbolism that you need to look at and study a little bit more closely. Well, why? Why is that there? Great. Get yourself a good commentary if you really want to know these things. 
With God the Father seated on the throne and the Holy Spirit represented by the seven lamps, the stage was then set for revelation of Christ himself as the slain lamb. And so that's just a picture of the type of things that we'll hear in heaven, that this, this type of atmosphere is, is there, and, and we will get to a, just see this. This is our future. We are, we are being, this revelation known as the revealing, people confuse the word, it's the apocalypse, and the apocalypse is often mentioned, it's this thought of like, it's all, it's all just death and destruction, and it's all confusing to people. There was a movie many years ago called Apocalypse Now, it's about war, right? Again, there's the, the revealing uh, the, the, this Greek word is really speaking about the revelation, the revealing of Jesus Christ that will be uh, coming back to this to rule and reign on this earth. But also activities happen in the heavenly realm on, from, from heaven to earth during that time that will be cataclysmic for the world. So people who are left here on the earth who did not go to be with Christ, they are going to have to be either tribulation survivors and the only way you survive the tribulation at that point is that you become a believer in Jesus Christ because ultimately every person uh, going into the millennium when Jesus Christ finally comes back, that's a thousand year reign upon the earth, has to be saved. And they got saved during the tribulation. Nothing will be undefiled that goes into the millennium. Okay, so let's understand the holiness of heaven. Okay, so before the throne, there was a sea of glass like crystal in the midst of the throne and around the throne were four living creatures full of eyes in front and in back. The four living creatures was like a lion. The second, like, like living creatures like a calf. The third living creature had a face like a man. And the fourth living creature was a, like a flying eagle. The four living creatures, each having six wings, were full of eyes around and within and they do not rest day and night, saying, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. These sets of this set of verses, I believe this description is so helpful. Their identity in, in 6 through 8, they are, they are a special order of created beings associated with the throne of God, apparently combining characteristics both of the cherubim concerned with the public government glory of God, and you could see that in Genesis chapter 3, Ezekiel 25, Ezekiel chapter 10, and then the seraphim concerned with the holiness of God. Remember when Isaiah is touched, right, with the burning coal because he says, I, I live among a people of unclean lips. I myself am a person of unclean lips, and then he touched me, which represents cleansing. And so everybody in, this, in the presence of God has been cleansed. He says here, their intelligence, um, their intelligence, these creatures, and insight into God's plan for the earth are seen in their being full of eyes. If you remember the image last week, you saw these wings, like eyes are everywhere, like, oh my goodness, like, do you realize who, what this is going to be like? This type of experience that's coming for us, this isn't just a sci-fi movie. This is the future of the Christian. I believe most movies that try to tackle this stuff, that the, the superhero realm and all this stuff and, and superheroes, they're all trying to model this stuff. There's, there's so many attempts in this world to get to the heart of the matter, but they miss it because they don't exalt Jesus. They exalt another man. They exalt another hero. And that's what happens. That's why the Hollywood thing is so self-centered. It's got a lot of stuff going on in there. And there is some... There is some incredible special effects that can come out of those movies. Like, oh my goodness, like, you know, the powerful stuff. But, but this type of stuff that's going to take place in our future is utterly glorious. Because keep this in mind, as much as you and I will be trembling at the holiness of God, we're safe. Just think about that. That is so amazing. Most Christians need to understand how secure they are in Jesus Christ. This is so important. You cannot grow as a Christian, in my estimation, if you don't get yourself to know the grace of God that was poured out for you once and for all. If you keep revisiting all the things in your life, the, the way backs, all those things that just keep hurting you, that keep bothering you, you need to take a special cleansing bath in the Word of God and revisit the truth that's set as yours and move on to maturity because that's what God wants for you. Then you can understand and look forward to your anticipated future with Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. 
But their likeness to animals and man indicates the character of God's judicial government toward the earth since the whole earth scene is about to be visited by judgment. That's why you and I want to rescue the perishing, care for the dying, Jesus the merciful, Jesus will save. I want this church, Grace Lighthouse Church, to be known as a salvation station. Stop by and, and get the salvation you need, the real salvation. We'll do our best to help people in crisis. We do our best to, but again, the greatest need that I have is a need to know Jesus Christ and to know that he's coming again. The believer does not have to fear hearing the words, depart from me, I never knew you. That is what will be told to people who did not do the right thing with Jesus. And finally, there will be never ending worship. You guys can get ready to come up because I think we're gonna uh, begin to take communion. Yeah. Whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and cast their crowns before the throne. See, you and I will have somehow in our future, those of us who've been rewarded by Jesus Christ, somehow those crowns remain a permanent opportunity for us to cast them at Jesus' feet because everything that's good in my life comes from him. Amen? Everything good in my life has come from him. Every provision he's made in my life has come from him. Every bit of kindness that he's expressed to me that can produce in me more kindness that could come out of this guy. That's from him. And if, that all, if all that gets invested in him, I will have crowns for all eternity to throw at his feet. And it will be a joy because I can say, Jesus, look what you did. Look what you invited me to. Look at the future that you prepared for me. Look at the things that you want me to be a part of. You guys hear me? Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and I'm just about done here. Their worship, they adore the Lord all God, all God Almighty, and they are joined in worship by the 24 elders. This is a worship atmosphere. This is a place in which God has prepared a future place for all of us to be who know him and love him, and we will have the privilege of worshiping with them. Closing with this scripture, and then I want to pray. Revelation chapter 21, verses 23 to 27. The city had no need of the sun or the moon to shine. In it, for the glory of God illuminated it. Let's talk about the new Jerusalem that's going to be coming down from heaven. This is after even these events. These events are so significant. The Lamb is the light. Who's the Lamb? The Lord Jesus Christ. And the nations of those who are saved, do you hear that? Are saved, shall walk in its light. And the kings of the earth bring their glory and honor into it. Its gates shall not be shut at all by day. Come on in, guys. We'd love to have you here. Its gates shall not be shut at all by day. There shall be no night there. there. They shall bring the glory and the honor of the nations into it. But there shall be by no means enter it, it anything that defiles or causes an abomination or a lie. But only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. So we have a prepared place that you and I, believer, will be in someday. Right now, Jesus is preparing that place, and I can't even imagine what it's like when a believer, whether it be my own dad who passed recently, or Toby, or other believers, Charles Stanley, the beloved Charles Stanley, others, Lord, uh, who immediately, they're, they're gone, their life is over, they're with Jesus, and what are they experiencing right now? I believe they're experiencing the presence of Almighty God, but there's more to their future that hasn't even happened yet. There's incremental things that are going to happen that you and I, that's why when we study Revelation, what we are doing is we are prepping for our glorious future. Amen? Amen. Heavenly Father, Lord, as we take the Lord's Supper, Lord, as we just celebrate this wonderful thing that Jesus has provided to us, Lord, pour out your grace upon us again that we would be the people who live out of gratitude live out of joy, live out of knowledge of the truth, that we would fight the good fight of faith because the glorious future that is in store for us, Lord, of those of us who have called upon you to save us. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.